We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up, bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. Welcome everyone to AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. I am Aubrey Edwards, here with my best friend, uh, Will Washington. I was like, who the hell are you? <laughs> Will Washington. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but you also stumbled over your own name, so I was like, all right, I see where we're... Well, it's like, to be fair, it's not my real name, so it's like, whatever. I know, I thought like, you <laughs> almost have to remember. But no offense to you, Will, but I actually have my best friend on here today. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome Chris Estelle to the podcast. He is our head of wardrobe. He is my personal coffee friend and one of my closest friends at AEW. So hello, sir. How are you? Very well. Thank both of you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. I also appreciate you constantly rescheduling this because this is now the third time we've tried to do this. So the last time was Will's fault because he needs a root canal. The time before that, you were traveling and a bomb exploded <laughs> in an airport. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite the ordeal. Yes. I just come back from, I don't remember where, but I was landed at MCI. And uh, we were standing by the baggage claim, waiting on the bags, and somebody's bag came off of the conveyor belt and it hit the stopper and exploded. And uh, luckily, it was a, a heavy built box, and it exploded up and not out. And apparently, the guy had some lithium batteries. He was a, uh, a carpenter or something like that. He traveled for work. And you know, the thing that they ask you every time when you check a bag, do you have any lithium batteries? Apparently, he did. And uh, it took me back to a previous time in my life. I didn't know where I was for, for a few minutes. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was very scary. And then I, I didn't get a, I didn't get, I didn't get my luggage until the following Monday. Which is crazy very, because you travel with your sewing machine. That's correct. And I, you know, th- if without that, I, I can't. I'm on a standstill. I can't do anything. So forced vacation is what you're saying. Forced vacation. The FBI went through my bags. Things like that. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you mentioned uh, MCI, which most people know if they travel is the shorthand for the Kansas City Airport. And if you're watching the video edition of the show, you see your KC hat. And so that would give most people the impression, as you and I have talked about before, as being in the middle of the country is wonderful. But you from Kansas City. Absolutely. Born and raised. I love this place. If I got my choice, I'll never leave this. Really? It shaped who I am. Created a, uh, well, my parents as well, but it created a, an environment that one would want to grow up in. And I faced all the same challenges that everyone else does when they're younger. But Kansas City is home. No matter where I am in the world, Kansas City is home. No matter if the Royals suck or the Chiefs are great. Kansas City is home. <laughs> no, that's such an easy statement to make, by the way, right now. We're like, because I have multiple friends who are Kansas City fans, and it's like, okay, if the Chiefs suck, but Mr. Three of the last four Super Bowls, it's very easy. Yeah, very. Well, you know, and I mean, I, I wasn't always a Kansas City fan. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't. Uh, I was a not a Patriots fan, but I was a Tom Brady fan. I know that's sacrilege right now. Yeah. Sacrilege. But I was a Tom Brady fan. But, you know, when we started, you know, picking up steam and Patrick Mahomes came into the picture, it's hard not to root for them. It's hard not to root for them because the things they do are so magical. And uh, just then the way they make the city feel and make the city feel alive. So to have a championship opportunities and, you know, several championship wins. I mean, what, what can you complain about? You can't ask for more. Yeah, but you have also all of the Taylor Swift attention coming your way as well. So there's that too. It's not really well, a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I remember when uh, it was last season and the Chiefs were coming back to town and I and I was coming back to town from some somewhere and we were at MCI and um, there was Swifties at the airport and I and they were there were so many of them and it's so great to have a following just not at the airport. I, I got things to do. <laughs> I, I don't you know, I, I'm sure she's great, but, you know, I mean. It's a good time. It's definitely the attention's good. We just got to make sure Travis Kelsey keeps performing. That's what we got. Yes. My favorite part about MCI is that you guys have a brand new airport now, but I had no idea. So like the Taylor Swift phenomenon happens. And then one day, like we're flying to MCI for work and I get off the plane 
And immediately I'm like, I don't know where I am because I've never been to this airport before. But there's yeah. a bunch of Travis Kelsey jerseys everywhere. So I'm like, man, Taylor Swift must be in town. I didn't make the obvious connection <laughs> that I was actually in Kansas City. You know, what's crazy is I don't know why they would show up to that airport. There's a downtown airport that she'd likely fly into. And, you know, <laughs> right. so, but I'm not going to tell them that I'm just going to keep on. Oh, my God. So, so I'm curious, like born and raised in Kansas City, but um, as you had mentioned when we were talking about batteries exploding in check bags, you had a previous life. So you actually went into the military. I did. I spent 10 years in the United States Navy, I served this great country, I wouldn't change it for the world, and had some, some good times and some bad times. But I think that overall, the leadership that I had in the Navy prepared me for being a leader here so that I don't make some of the mistakes that I've seen get made. And I think that, you know, overall, the military taught me, first of all, it taught me how to love the country, to understand what we're fighting for, to, to go to different places and see how other people are living and see what they have and they don't have. So, you know, every time that I get to touch American soil, no matter what state it is, I realize how much I love this great country. I'm proud to have defended it. And some of the worst times that we've had and don't get me wrong i had a blast but you know i had i had <laughs> no pun intended <laughs> yeah they were yeah, right? <laughs> they were uh, they were paying me to have fun sometimes so i i just um it's one of those things you know my father my father was in the navy or excuse me my father was in the army my grandfather was in the navy my uncle was in the navy and oh my god i to serve as well I come from a long line uh, yeah, this was inevitable. Military is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was not a great student in school, and so not a whole lot of colleges were lining up to give me <laughs> give me scholarships. So I said, right, I'll go serve the country and make something of myself. And that's what we did. <laughs> well, and then of course to to bring it all full circle, you wound up in AEW, um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, I had to bring it back to how we even got here, and you know, kind of talking about how. You know, AEW, of course, uh, employed at one point famed seamstress Sandra Gray and the goat. Yeah, the, the goat. She she really laid uh, a lot of the foundation for the, the wardrobe department in AEW. But here you are at, really at the top head wardrobe artist. So how did that all come to be? First and foremost, I got to thank Sandra. She gave me so much and continues to give me so much knowledge. Uh, but I fell backwards into this job. I had no intention of working at AEW. I had no intention of being a gear maker. I had no intention of this being my primary sources of income. You know, I mean, I think anybody, when you can make money off of your artwork, it just seems insane. You know, people pay me to do stuff that I enjoy doing. So it's not like work, but the, the AEW had a show in Kansas City at the Silverstein Arena in Independence. And I did Fuego Del Sol's gear and I brought it. And then I I brought a portfolio for Sandra to see and, you know, I treated it like a job interview because a lot of times I notice, you know, people don't treat this like a job interview. You know? And I, I wanted to treat it like, hey, you know, if you're going to take a look at me, I'm going to give my due diligence to to give the respect. Will this be, was this in 21? It had to be. 22? I think it's 21. It had to be. And she saw my work and then we got along great. I always called her Mima because she was in bed by like nine o'clock. Afterwards, she couldn't talk to her. <laughs> so, but um, she called me like two days later and said, "Hey, you know, we'd like you to come to New York and, and start traveling with us." And trust me, I had no idea what I was doing. Still don't. But you know, it's one of those things that I'm super proud of where I've, you know, how far I've come. And you know, after she retired. They were looking for somebody to lead the department. And I said, I could probably do that. And so here we are. Damn. This is wild. I, I like that it's just like, oh, yeah, you have this goat that everyone in the industry knows. And now it's just, nope, now you have her job. Good luck. Have fun. And it's like, oh, take, take it easy, buddy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <you're> like, <laughs> right? Peace. Gonna go retire. Bye. <laughs> She's just like, dying yeah. away. But I mean, like, you're, you're absolutely killing it. Like, you're doing incredible work. I constantly see you working both in arena and not in arena. <laughs> and, and I'm just so, so, so excited to talk more about you uh, and more about what you do here on AEW Unrestricted after a quick break. 
AEW Unrestricted. It's Aubrey and Will with our special guest, Chris Estelle. He is the head wardrobe artist for All Elite Wrestling. And Chris, uh, I want to ask you about really some of your favorite gear stories. You know, talking about um, some of your favorite designs that you've gotten to make and some of the inspirations behind those designs. First and foremost, I think working with Brian Daniels has been a highlight of anything that I've ever done. Um, because he's so, he's so kind mm -hmm. and he lets you be free. You know, he'll tell you, you know, what colors or what. I think his, his just his past Wembley, uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I went out to, cause I didn't see any of the show. Man, I, I was so busy, but I, I went out and I got to see him come down the ramp and that was a long ramp too. So I got a real good look at it. And uh, <laughs> I, I won't lie. Like, uh, you know, I, I, you know, welled up the tears a little bit because it's like, you know, this is, I didn't know, but he would then go on to become champion. So mm -hmm. I've had a great track record of working with champions in the, in, in the company. And so now I work with him as the champion, which has been amazing. Uh, but the scales is a, is a question I get constantly. Mm -hmm. And yes, they are sewn on. Yes, they are cut on a machine. Yes, they are real fabric. And, uh, it takes forever. And there's scales on my floor right now from almost every jacket I've made just because I refuse to pick them up. My favorite thing about the scales is one, like you are, I, I was having this conversation with Salem in our makeup department, like that you're one of the people that has defined Brian Danielson's look in this final part of his career, which is oh, wow. kind of incredible. Like when you say it like that, it's just like, oh shit. But like, yeah, I same, remember... Man. Uh, it was World's End last year, and I came up to you with one of my ref shirts, which you are very responsible for uh, making me look so good. And I said, hey, can you alter this? And without even looking at me, you're like, no. <laughs> you're making this, this freaking jacket for uh, Wrestle Kingdom. That's and right. it was the first one you had done. And then after that, he's like, okay, just make all of them. And I'm just like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I has no idea what he just asked for. That was so... And to this day, it's so brutal to do these, <laughs> but he looks different. Mm -hmm. And when you got guys on the roster, for instance, like I, I don't get to work with these guys, but like the House of Black, their look is so defined. You know who they are as soon as you see them. If you were to see a jacket of theirs laying around, it doesn't even have to have their name on it. You know it belongs to them. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, other than Brian's logo being on his jacket, uh, when you see the scales, you know who it belongs to. And that was my goal was to, you know, cause Brian, you know, his, his gear while great, it didn't change a lot over the years, you know, from all the companies that he had been in. So I was like, you know, if I get a hold of him, let's see if we can do something different. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, but yeah, his, and then I think my favorite from this year though, is probably MJS Wembley gear. It was so ridiculous. <laughs> It's so over the top <laughs> and I hated stitching every piece of thread into that because it was like, this is so, obnoxious. but that's the only way I like MJF is when he's obnoxious. I mean, so. it's the only way that we get to deal with him. So it's, <laughs> it's right. do you really have any other option? Like, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. And then on the other side of it, uh, Soraya is one of my favorite people. She kind of just gives me free reign. So let's just do it. And we changed her to red from mm -hmm. black and man, she looks good in red, you know? So it's just one of those things. And, and that's what I'm really big on is if you don't look good in something, I'll tell you, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I'll tell you like, that doesn't compliment you. But when she put that red on and I remember when she came around the corner and I saw her and I was like, wow, you definitely made the right decision. Mm -hmm. She looks great. And you know, just everyone else that I get to work with, uh, you know, I've worked with FTR. I've worked with uh, John Moxley. Chris Jericho is one of the guys who I can always count on to come up with something last minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about last minute, there, there was a couple of stories I wanted to talk about because I think one of the more humorous ones, and I knew it was going to come your way the second it was pitched in the office, but uh, Christian Cage in the turtleneck ref shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so that idea was Christian's idea. Uh, he Don't said, hey, can you make me, if you can make me a ref shirt. And, you know, the biggest compliment from him was it turned out better than I ever thought it would. And I believe that when a talent compliments you like that and you exceed their expectations, 
that only solidifies that you belong there. So that was the most atrocious shirt that I have ever made. <laughs> and he wore it like a champ. Dude, I was watching Collision and I saw him come out in that. And I went, this is just so over the top. Chris has to be responsible for this. And then I saw like on your Instagram after it aired, like, I'm like, oh, I friggin' knew I called it. Uh, yeah, I can, uh, I only, when I posted that on Instagram, I, I could only put, yeah, it was me. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> you know, but uh, it got a great reaction from, from our fans and even from, you know, people who, you know, don't really watch wrestling that, you know, a lot of people were just commenting on it and saying it's the best and worst thing I've ever seen. So, <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the over the top, you know, aspects of what we do. And Christian Cage, he, he knows who he is. He knows his character and it fit him perfectly. But on the other side of that, this one like kind of leaked on the internet. And I thought it was an astonishing testament to what you're able to do. And it was Allentown, Pennsylvania. Oh. Um, and I, and you know where I'm going with I this. I do. Yeah. Because, uh, I, it was one of those nights where we wanted Ultimo Guerrero. Mm -hmm. we, we had advertised him, but we had advertised him with his mask. But when he showed up to the building, he didn't have a mask. And we spent the day looking around all of Pennsylvania, any place within driving distance to find an Ultimo Guerrero mask. And we came pretty close, but it was like they were closing and we just, we did not have an Ultimo Guerrero mask, but on all of the advertising, we had already put Ultimo Guerrero with a mask. And so we had only one place we could turn <laughs> and that was yeah. to you. Well, if, I'll, I'll give you that story. Jimmy Jacobs comes up to me and Jimmy and I, I, I've maybe spoken to Jimmy five times, you know? And so he comes up to me and he says, well, you know, Ultimo Guerrero, you know, and this is two hours before the show started. Oh, yeah. Typical. We thought he had the mask. <laughs> in, our, in our defense, in the office's defense, we thought he had it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and I said, well, Jimmy, I can't do that. Like, two hours, a luchy mask takes, you know, two days at least, and I'm not great at doing that anyway. And so, and so he said, well, you know, you got to tell the boss. And so I was like, I, I, I just got to tell the boss this isn't possible. Oh, my God. So about five minutes later, there I am making a mask. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, for what the time I had, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but I was impressed, honestly, like genuinely, I was floored. When I saw that mask, I was like, the fact that you whipped that up in two hours, like is, is a straight up testament to your abilities. And the fact that like you had all the doubt in the world, but the fact that you pulled that off. I mean, I, just to, just to emphasize this point, like there is a unique skill set when building Lucha masks. Like it's mm -hmm. one thing to make gear. It's an entirely different thing to make a mask. And like, if you deconstruct one that was made in Mexico, like they're extremely high quality. It's like, there yeah. are people oh, yeah. whose whole jobs is just making masks. So it's like, this is a huge undertaking. And just to kind of stress the point of how crazy this story is. Like, well, I didn't have everything that you would need. I didn't have the main thing that you would need to make a mask and that's twill tape to keep the shape. Mm. So most masks are made of spandex and the, the twill tape on the inside of the seams, it keeps the shape to your head. So I didn't have that, but we, we did get a mask created and uh, I had some help. Uh, my buddy, John, he cut out some of the stuff for me while I was trying to do it. And, you know, I didn't get to do the lace up in the back. So our, our phenomenal production team did a great job in hiding some of the flaws within it. But Ultimo Guerrero could not have been nicer about it. Uh, he actually put a really nice Facebook post out thanking me for the work that I did. And then uh, I think it was Bandito came up to me not too long ago. And he was like, you're a hero in Mexico. And I was like, you know, I, and I was like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know why, but I, you know, the Mexican culture, the Hispanic culture, I'm so fascinated by it. And to be able to have someone a legend like Ultimo Guerrero say something like that about me, say some kind words. It's truly a testament to how he received it. Mm -hmm. And he wore it again. He wore it like three or four more times. <laughs> <laughs> but in his, he wore it to, as an entrance piece to the ring, which is exactly what it should have been. Right. Yeah. But that was one of the, that was the most stressful time I've ever had it. The most stressful because if, in my, in my eyes, if I get this mask wrong, I'll never be able to go to Mexico to do anything. 
You know what I mean? And so luckily he was really nice about it and being the legend that he is, he appreciated my work. So yeah, but you know, when Jamie comes up to you and says, we need a mask in two hours, the answer is never no. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Especially <laughs> like, when the next phrase is, then you have to tell the boss. It's like, well, how much do you like your job? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was that. And then, you know, I could just tell in the boss's eyes that no matter what I said, I was going to be doing this. Mess. You're going to say yes, <laughs> yeah. and you're going to do <laughs> yeah. this. That's just how so, this works. It's effort. And, you, and you know, like in in everybody's defense here, like I think Tony, especially knowing Tony as well as I do, I I feel like he has a lot of trust in you. Like when it comes to really anything, he you know, there's so many times where you know we'll be preparing for a, a post show press conference, and it's literally like, okay, I need Chris. <laughs> you know, I know Chris is going to be good for making sure that I look good, making sure I have the right tie, making sure I have whatever. And I think, you know, in Tony's view, he saw, you know, we, we needed this mask and he knew if there was one person who would be up for the challenge, even with all of the doubt you could possibly have in it, he knew you would be the one. Oh. And uh, I think that's a testament to everything you do for our talent, everything you do for Tony and this trial by fire. It truly is. And, you know, um, speaking of Tony, it, I'm, I'm big on the executives in the company, always looking the part, mm -hmm. you know, always making sure that whether it's getting their pants hemmed or having a clean shirt on standby or, or whatever the case may be. Tony's one of those guys. He, he's the boss. He's the face. So you, he cannot go to a media scrum or anything looking bad. And he trusts me enough to know that I will tell him, Hey man, you probably need a new shirt, you know, or something like that. And, and it's come to the point now I just drop shirts off at pay per view. <laughs> I'll just drop him off. Yeah. You know, if he wears them, he wears them. If he doesn't, he doesn't. But I think the company overall has trust in me that I have the best interest of the company in mind anytime I do anything. And, you know, I, I believe that that kind of atmosphere can only breed success. And AEW is one of those places that, you know, success is um, hard to come by. Mm -hmm. But when you get it, you better treat it well. It's not just that. It's that you work hard to hold on to that. It's, exactly. it's the success and the respect, right? Because it's one thing to earn it, but like you can lose it real quick in this business. Very quickly. And it's one of those things that, you know, you, you have to look at, what am I here for? Oftentimes, I've seen individuals get caught up in, you know, wanting to be one of the boys. And of course, being one of the boys would be great, you know, but I'm almost 40 years old, so I can't be, you know, I can't be doing what they do anymore. And uh, so I, I know what I'm there for. I know why I'm there and I know that people want me. There. And so that's all, that's all I need. Mm, so good. Okay. Uh, so much more to talk about. Another quick break here at AEW Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Will talking to Chris. And in the course of the time that we have started this podcast, he has gotten 32 text messages requesting gear. So if it hasn't been clear up to this point how important and pivotal he is to the success of AEW, <laughs> uh, I don't think I've gotten 32 texts in a single day. <laughs> like, let yeah, alone. It's rough. It's rough. Oh, my God. It's, it's rough. How, how do you manage all of it? Because, like, the, you're flying in with a sewing machine. You're sewing in your room in the hotel you're constantly working at the venue and i know you're working at home like how do you manage all of this i can't take any credit for it i have a wonderful team my team is consisted of um adrian emily rich landon I, we have created something that that works and i'm a big believer in defer the credit to the team and when something gets screwed up you take the it's just good. It's just the way it is. That's just, that's good leadership. So at any point in time, here, here's a, here's a good story on the team. Just two weeks ago or whatever it was, Chris Jericho's yellow jacket that he wore to the ring. I was on my flight when Chris texted me mm -hmm. and I said, well, I can't print any graphics. I can't do anything because I'm currently in the air. And when I got to the town, I was like, I don't have any resources. So I text Adrian. And I text Landon and I said, hey, guys, this is all we got to do. And Adrian printed out the graphics and overnighted them to me. And I teamed with Landon to get the graphics position. And then he sewed them on. Without them, I don't, I don't get that done. So creating a teamwork environment, a team first environment is how I manage it. Don't get me wrong. It drives me absolutely insane. But 
uh, it's always team first. And those guys, you know, they deserve a lot of the credit because sometimes I have to move on and do other things and they're finishing my work. Mm-hmm. So that, that is, you know, being, having a, having a solid team is how we manage this roster. Yeah. I, I remember seeing that jacket when I did the match and afterwards I told Chris, I was like, that's a good jacket for you. It's very Fisher price. Like it's, it's perfect for the current iteration of his character. Yeah. And especially with the big high guys on the back, like, you know, and Chris is such a pleasure to work with too. He's so creative. And when Jericho, when he tells you, Hey man, just, you know, let's, let's do something with this. He's giving you the, okay. He says, I trust your creative ability to not make me look like a fool when I go out there. And I think that is the biggest compliment you get from one of the goats of wrestling. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was the recent, uh, it occurred at San Diego Comic-Con, but we had the Battle of the Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) And just watching your face immediately. (laughs) And so, of course, this was a collaboration with Adult Swim. And being that this is exactly what it was, you had to to make costumes for this. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about when, one, how did you find out? When did you find out about this? And what was the process going through having to make essentially famed Adult Swim characters that fit the mold of professional wrestlers playing those characters? So I got told about this about two weeks before it. And um, I wasn't ready for the challenge, but I was told, you're doing it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. <laughs> again, team works. The people over at Adult Swim couldn't have been nicer. They couldn't have been greater to work with. I had to be reminded that they're not wrestling people. So they don't, you know, they don't understand what we do. They didn't understand what I do. So I had to walk them through. This is how it's going to be done. And we got all seven characters done. Adrian did several characters. Rich did several characters. I did several characters. The makeup team that was there, they did an amazing job. But more, most importantly, people who watch you know, Adult Swim and those specific shows, they like their characters. Mm-hmm. They like the way they are. You don't change them. And so for me, it was how do I respect the character in the show while bringing a pro wrestling theme to it? And I think that uh, we did a phenomenal job. Adult Swim couldn't have been happier with how it went down. Um, Tony was there as well. And, you know, when he walks up to you and says, hey, great job. That's all I needed. Because if he was happy, then that's all I needed. If if he wasn't happy, I wasn't going to come to work next week, the next nope. Wednesday. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wasn't going to, it was not going to be there. But in my head, I took that job on as uh, your job's only mm-hmm. You have to, you have to kill this. You have to do it. And to be out at San Diego, I had never been to a company. And so to be out there and to see all of the creativity that, you know, people who don't do what I do to see them out there in their costumes. And it was just such a great environment. And then the show, the show was wonderful. You know, the, the, the wrestlers that we had in the costumes, they couldn't have been any better. I, you know, I wouldn't switch any of those guys out with any other worker because they did a really good job as well. And it was nice to do something non-wrestling, but wrestling. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had an absolute blast. And then I think, I think there was a pay-per-view like the next day or so, or I had to fly right back out. Blood and Guts was the day before. It, there was, I had to fly back to, it's either Collision or something. Yeah, we had Collision. We had Collision in um, Arlington the very next day. That's right. So I got up, I did Comic-Con, and I got an hour of sleep, got up, flew to Arlington, and then did Collision. Was it Battle of day. the Belts also? Was it Collision Battle of the Belts? I feel like it was. I think it might have been, because Blood and Guts was the day before. Comic Con was Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday was the the, the, it was the ROH pay per view. That's what it was. That's what you, you're absolutely right. ROH yes. pay per view. I, yeah. I know something, and neither of you did. Like this doesn't. <laughs> I my brain is frozen in certain parts. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, Ring of Honor. <laughs> that, well, that's what it was. Was uh, it was Ring of Honor, and that's where my uh, I was failing to make the association because I'm thinking like AW didn't have a pay per view, but we did have Death Before Dishonor. That's right, a phenomenal show, like top to bottom. The whole that the whole Arlington run was great. I oh, think fantastic. I, I I have such fond memories of that whole run in Arlington. I'll always think of the churros. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I will go back just for that. 
<laughs> yeah, churros and catering like on a regular basis. Absolutely. How is this not happening on 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 the road? Can someone tell whoever's planning all in in Arlington that we need churros and catering? Yes, churros Absolutely. and uh, gamer chairs. That was mm. my favorite part of it. The gamer chairs. Gamer yeah. chairs. I've never like I have a gamer chair here in my in my office, but uh, I had never on the road got to work in a gamer chair. Totally spoiled me. Game got to the- and then the, yeah, and it, it, it was all of the rooms. God all the rooms uh because i i uh, the side story was successfully able to sneak a talent who needed to meet with tony into the building uh, but had to not be seen i guess we could tell it now because they've returned yeah, but yeah. like jamie hate yeah it was jamie hater yeah. who had to make her return who had it was before all in and until we could get her we didn't want her to be seen by talent didn't want her to be seen by fans and the fact that that building had enough people to hide her in the back room and sneak her in. And then when it was time to meet with Tony, we were able to do it. And it was cool. And nobody knew. And uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. I think, I think that's cool. That's really cool. One of the things that uh, I wanted to kind of bring it full circle. So you, you talked about uh, at the beginning, you know, this not being something that you really saw as a career for yourself, but you knew that you had to take the chance. And the thing that I really wanted to ask you was how, how did this even become, even even from a hobby standpoint, how did it become something that you were even interested in? I've always known how to sew. My mom, my mom taught me how to sew when I was a kid. And then Mrs. Sonia Felder, when I was in uh, ele- or, excuse me, middle school, she had me sew a football. I think we all did something like that in high school or middle school. We sewed a football in home ec, and it wasn't that great. And then she took it and she threw it at me. And she's like, do it right or don't do it at all. And so I did it and she was great in coaching me. And then I went to the Navy and then I, I altered all my own clothes because the uniforms, they never fit. No. And so I altered all my own clothes there. And then when I got out, I got into independent wrestling. And then I had a friend named Marty Bell who I, I fixed a pair of shorts for her and then created another pair of shorts for her. And then she told somebody, somebody else told somebody else. And then. I was making gear for the indies and then COVID happened. Mm. So that's when I really learned how to do this. And I made a couple thousand masks and donated them to retirement homes and schools and stuff like that. And it was just from there. I really, I really started to appreciate the craftsmanship that it takes. And then, you know, the first time, like I said, with Sandra was like, that was the first time I had ever done anything for anybody on TV. And, uh, Ruby Soho was also the, one of the first ones to take a chance on me. Uh, it was new year's Eve and I was just sitting around and I got a call from a number I didn't know. And it was Ruby. And she was like, Hey, my gear maker backed out. I got this big championship match on Wednesday. I was wondering if you could do something for me. And I had like three days and, uh, I did it. And I, I'll never forget. I sat upstairs as a fan. I sat upstairs with my mom and my family and I watched Ruby Soho walk out that tunnel and it was something that I made. And that, that right there told me you can do this. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's just taken off from there and I've had so many great people who support me. You never do it by yourself. You never do it. And people open doors for you and it just takes courage to walk through them. That's all it is. You know, and they, and, and so that's, I mean, that's where I'm at with it now. I'm very happy here. I'm very excited for what's upcoming. And I, I think my favorite part about the job is when I get surprised. Like uh, right when we were at All In in Wembley, one of the production people came and grabbed me and said, hey, we need you to come over here to this room. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. That's okay. I knock on the door, opens, it's Ricochet. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, man, how are you? Like, And he just needed me to do something real quick for him. But that's just one of those, one of those things that wrestling can still surprise me after all these years. So that's, it's the love of the game. It's one of those things where like, I, I mean, I, I casually mention it, but like, you're responsible for altering all of my shirts because mm-hmm. they don't make women's size referee shirts. They make dude sizes. And even if it's a small makes it look like I'm wearing a trash bag. And now it's at the point where I just hand it off to you and you don't even have to measure or tweak anything. You've just got this shit memorized, which is great. 
And I remember specifically, I think one of the first times I met you, you were working with Sandra still. And she specifically asked me like, hey, do you have any shirts that need to be done? Because this is the only thing I haven't taught Chris yet. Yep. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah, it like yeah. always sticks in my mind and it's great. And every time I see like a new Brian Danielson jacket or new Jericho gear or new MJF gear, no matter how obnoxious it it, it is, like brown and lime green, like that's disgusting, <laughs> but like yeah. somehow you made it work. Um, every time I see something from you, it's always excellent. It's always top tier. It's always just like, it's it's got a stamp of approval on it that I don't think other people have the capacity to hit. It's just so absolutely good. I had to be reminded by uh, one of my one. Oh, we know Jacoby Watts. Mm -hmm. he's, he's on the roster. Uh, wrestles for Ring of Honor. He's like Chris. You don't realize like you're you're some people's north star. Mm -hmm. You're where they want to go. And when he said that, that just cemented it in my mind. Like you you can't be putting out crappy work, dude. You have to make sure that it's TV ready. And trust me, I run a lot across a lot of things that come across my table that are not TV ready. And you know who I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. And then I end up having to fix them, which is fine. <laughs> but, we won't name names, but. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to name names. But you know who you are. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just knowing that the des where I am is the destination that some people wish to reach motivates me. Because. I'll tell you straight up, you're not going to knock me out of this mountain. I'll walk away when I want to. Hell yeah. And that's the kind of work ethic that I have. And you're welcome to join me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you're welcome to join me. But, uh, you know, God willing, I'm not going anywhere. And uh, AEW is the place to be for, for me and for, you know, anyone who wants to be there. And, and as far as your shirts, it's just a shirt. You make it look good. Hey. Aubrey doesn't need the shirt. The shirt needs Aubrey. Oh. And you know what I mean? So you just want just... me to buy the coffee next time. Oh, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, this has been an absolute pleasure having you here on AEW Unrestricted. And you can see all of Chris's work across all the shows that we do on a weekly basis. Because uh, AEW is everywhere and we're continuing to grow and we're continuing to be in front of you if you want to catch more of this podcast definitely check us out on uh apple podcast spotify wherever you get your podcast just search aew unrestricted you can also check out video editions of this show on our youtube channel our aew unrestricted youtube channel hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode and catch up on all the latest aew shows on the go when you download the tnt and tbs apps from the app store and google play then sign up for our weekly newsletter at tnt com slash elite fleet to get updates on upcoming shows live events sweepstakes merchandise and more you can watch dynamite on wednesdays on tbs you can watch ring of honor honor club every thursday you can watch rampage on tnt every friday you can watch collision tnt on saturday and literally chris's gear is on every single show that we do so you may not know it but you've been enjoying his work this entire time I am Aubrey Edwards here with Will Washington. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted. Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted.